Hi everyone, Dan and Lisa here from Fireside Strategic. We believe there's a new way to grow businesses that combines razor sharp strategy and the real stuff of humanity and mission. In the Fireside Chat series, we interview CEOs who share this philosophy. Today, we're chatting with Rob Lang, founder and CEO of Farm One. Rob, can you tell our audience a little bit about how the company Farm One came to be? Sure, great to be with you here today. Um, Farm One is I guess my third company, technically, I started it uh, around five years ago. And really, it started because I was very, very interested in food, kind of as a passionate amateur rather than a chef or anything like that. And I had taken a few culinary classes in LA and in Thailand and kind of got to know a lot of the ingredients that you get at farmers markets and the sort of specialty things that are only available certain times of the year in certain places in the world. And I was really curious about whether I could use new technology to grow those plants in a controlled environment and bring that technology to a city like New York so that maybe chefs could get access to rare produce year round with that new technology. And so I started the company in 2016, really not knowing very much about anything to do with agriculture or controlled environment agriculture or hydroponics. Um, but slowly built the company and hired people who did know what they were doing and, and managed to start to serve chefs in New York City. And we've gone through a bunch of different changes since then, but that was really the origin story. That's how we got started. It's so unique to meet someone in the ag space that comes into it without knowing much about agriculture, having it be more an interest or a hobby. Can you tell us a little bit about what that was like to enter the space of specialists as somebody who isn't a specialist in agriculture? Yeah, well, I think that sometimes, you know, innovation happens when people are naive and they enter something and they don't know how difficult it's going to be. And, you know, also hopefully they're not kind of entrenched with a traditional way of doing things. And so I was kind of coming at this really, you know, trying to look at it from a consumer or a chef point of view. Like, I wish I could get these ingredients year round. How can we make that possible? And also, you know, vertical farming is a really new tech. Like you can see in the image behind me, um, that's an example of one of our units. It, it uses a combination of hydroponics, which is growing plants in a water-based nutrient solution instead of soil. It normally involves some kind of controlled environment. So you're controlling the air temperature, maybe the humidity, maybe even the airflow across the plants. And you're probably using LED lights. Uh, and LED lights have been around for a while, but it's only really in the past sort of 10 years or so that they've made it possible to viably grow plants indoors uh, in an efficient way without producing too much heat and without using too much energy. So even though I was very new to the ag space, uh, there weren't really a lot of people out there who had experience in vertical farming anyway, because it was a brand new technology. And so I think that was somewhat to our advantage. And also, you know, coming in with a fresh approach where we were trying to grow specialty produce for chefs, there was no one else really doing that. So we could kind of come in, experiment, do things, get some attention without really competing against an entrenched incumbent or anything like that. Um, and hopefully, you know, we've learned enough as we've grown that now, you know, we are the experts really in this. Um, and we've done that kind of from the ground up. So we've built software, we've built some hardware, and we've built processes around, you know, growing things in relatively small spaces in cities. Um, and no one else really had that. So yeah, I think that's been my experience. Uh, but it's been, yeah, it's been interesting as well. Really curious to dig into the foodie angle as a fellow foodie here. So chefs, and to just help understand exactly what the benefits are for chefs. A chef struggles prior to the creation of Farm One to get that really, really good quality local produce. Is that sort of the big problem we're solving for chefs? Yeah, so if you take a, new, a city like New York, right? Very, very competitive restaurant scene. Chefs um, also are from all over the world. They come to New York and they sort of show off their technique and their skills, but they often bring with them an appreciation of the ingredients that they used to be able to get back home. So you could have a chef mm. from Denmark or a chef from Mexico or a chef from Norway or something. And they've all been able to say, you know, back in Norway, they could forage for this certain ingredient, but now in New York, they can't get it. 
And traditionally in a city like New York, you're going to be bringing in product from California, which is kind of the breadbasket of this kind of stuff um, for the rest of the US. Or um, in the summertime in New York, you do get access to the farmer's market and it can be great here. But the problem is the growing season here is pretty short for a lot of that stuff. So it's pretty unreliable. And if you're doing any kind of food service, you want reliability, you want consistency. And you know, certainly if you're doing that at a very high level, like a Michelin star level, that consistency is a big part of that rating, right? It's like, can I get the same meal, the same quality every day? And so we thought that with vertical farming, we could bring that kind of consistency to them. Um, and that was something that you know was really, really attractive. Um, yeah. And I'll get on to soon what we had to do during COVID because obviously our restaurants kind of stopped operating. But certainly that was the beginning of how we established credibility in New York was using this new technology to bring consistency to a market that was previously um, quite variable. And also, you know, if you're shipping product in from a long way away, um, it's just not as fresh, you know, it's, it's a couple of days old by the time you use it. And so if you're a chef at the top end, you know, that difference is going to make, um, you know, it's, it's going to be really apparent to you. Yeah, that, that makes a ton of sense. So it isn't just the customer experience of having, you know, the best quality meals prepared. It's, hey, if the Michelin star really matters to you, which for chefs that have it, it really, really matters, right? Yeah. And you never know when the Michelin inspector is going to come. So if the offering is inconsistent, that could really damage your marketing and your brand. That's a real risk. Yeah, definitely. And uh, it's a it's a hugely competitive space, not just in New York, but you know, across the country, across the world. Chefs, um, you know, if you get to know them as a breed, I guess, you know, they they're hyper focused, they work so hard. Everyone in that kitchen it works so hard. Um, and they really expect the best. You know, that is the only way you get a Michelin star or three Michelin stars. You have to be obsessed with that. And so being able to supply those folks was, you know, very um, sort of educational as well. You know, getting to know those kitchens and the expectations they have. Like we literally would be supplying a, a leaf that would have to be like, half an inch and if it was 0.75 inches it was not acceptable you know we, there's a guy who um we would sell to who would measure using do you remember when the iphone had like that one button on the front right he would like measure these flowers to see if they like fit exactly on the iphone and then if they did like okay if not they're out you know and i think that like that's a that's a tough thing for a lot of businesses to handle in terms of supply Um, One of the experiences I had was before Farm One, uh, I lived and worked in Japan and Japan, you know, for many reasons is known like, you know, Toyota Way, all this kind of other stuff to do with business. But one of the things is attention to detail and, you know, that consistency and care about small things. And I think I I learned at least some of that um, from Japan and tried to bring some of that to Farm One. Um, And I think that, you know, I think we got some good respect uh, for that approach. Sounds like you had some very lucky customers that had somebody that pays so much attention to the details and focuses on quality so much. But we've touched on this already a couple of times. COVID happened. The restaurant industry got turned inside out. What happened to you guys? Yeah, so it wasn't great, you know. <laughs> so uh, I, can imagine. I think like I think, you know, beginning of March in 2020. Um, within a couple of days, it became clear that all of our customers were going to be closing. And, you know, that meant we lost all of our revenue. And the other piece of revenue that we used to have as well was people visiting the farm for tours and classes. And that was actually, you know, 50% of our revenue. It's a big deal. And so within a couple of weeks, that disappeared. Now, thankfully, we had raised money just before this. And so we had a bit of cash. Um, But really, you know, it was a tough time for everybody. And so what we did was we, you know, we had a farm full of produce, right? And we, of course, donated some of that, but a lot of our produce was kind of edible flowers and rare herbs and not really the kind of thing that anyone's going to get a huge meal out of straight away. And so we pivoted to um, try to sell some of these products to consumers and it went okay. Like people, of course, were really blown away by the quality and, and really excited about the rare varieties that we had. But it was the kind of stuff that people might buy once in a while. 
and they might buy for a dinner party. And of course, dinner parties are not happening during local lockdown. So all that kind of stuff was just difficult and itty bitty, and we would not really make a lot of money on it. So gradually towards the end of the summer, we decided, okay, let's try to switch to a subscription model. Let's harvest um, baby greens, like salad greens, microgreens, and then a small selection of herb herbs and flowers and offer that as a weekly subscription to our members. And the other piece of that that really kind of tied that together and turned it into something interesting was before COVID, we were selling to um, chef customers in reusable containers because the amount of plastic waste that if, like if you're not using reusables and most people aren't in the wholesale world, the amount of plastic waste is insane. I mean, it's literally, you know, hundreds and hundreds of these small clamshell containers. And, you know, I had got to know a lot about plastics with some other work that I had done with Google um, around sustainability. And I really sort of, came to the conclusion or gradually came to the conclusion that recycling just wasn't really working in the US. You know, most of the time, uh, recyclable products don't end up getting recycled. Uh, they either end up getting shipped off to Southeast Asia and someone else deals with it, or they end up in landfill or something else, you know? And so I, I was really pretty keen to continue that practice of using reusables that we had started with our chef customers and bring that to consumers. And so that weekly subscription became something that you could get in a reusable container, reusable tote bag, um, and we would deliver and then pick up the previous containers um, from the last week. And so as a system, it was like a nice uh, kind of closed loop. And also it gave us a more compelling offering. Like it's not just salad greens, it's also a zero waste approach. Um, and that was really, really popular. And we successfully kind of sold out of our farm in Tribeca um, and, you know, started to look for new space. So, so it was pretty much a, a good success story, but it certainly took several months to figure that out. And I, I don't want anyone to think that it was like an easy, kind of, you know, one day switch. Um, but we're really happy with the change. And now it's, you know, created a whole new business for us that we're really excited about. It's so striking how this was such a challenging situation. And in the beginning, there was this moment of reckoning. But then as time passed, you took the circumstances into your own hands and created an even more impactful business. I love that. Yeah, we try to. I mean, I'm definitely really glad that we had raised money because it gave us the time and the flexibility right. to make some changes. Uh, but also the team, you know, that's that's what you want from a startup team is people who can adapt and pivot and, you know, not get too hung up on how things were done before. Okay. And it required a complete operational change. It required people to change their job completely. It obviously, you know, my job completely changed. And now the focus of the company is, you know, consumers and everything that comes along with that. So before we had a B2B sales, small sales team. Um, now it's B2C marketing. Uh, but really what has made me so excited about it is now we've got the opportunity with consumers to do so much more. And so now our green subscription is kind of the core of our offering, but we're adding also smoothies and nut milks and mushrooms that you can get in the same or similar containers, reusable, uh, no plastic waste. And now we're about to add on uh, a bunch of other products as well. So starting this idea of a sort of like the best possible trip to the farmer's market, but in a weekly delivery. Um, and we're also uh, building out a brand new farm based on that whole model. And so it's been um, a really exciting change for us. And, you know, we're still figuring out lots and lots of things, uh, but we think that it's turning us into a more scalable company uh, and I, you know, I sort of say to our investors, like, I think you invested in a good company, but we're turning into a great company. And it's, it's a really, you know, really super nice thing. Yeah, super, super cool. And we'd love to dig more into the implications of this shift from B2B to B2C. But, but before that, I'm going to be extremely selfish. This is one of the wonderful things about doing an interview. You get to ask the most self-interested questions ever. And so okay. as a potential customer for when I move back to New York, which I'm about to do, I was doing a little bit of research on your products and I see, you know, all products are hundred percent plant-based on the website, but occasionally products contain honey. I'm curious about that. Why is oh, that? 
<laughs> well, actually, I don't know if we've actually sold anything yet that does contain honey, but it's kind of a uh, little, uh, I don't know, safety net for us in a way. I mean, you know, if you're, um, I'm, I'm a vegan person, but I do tend to not be as strict about honey. Honey is something where you're technically using an animal or an insect. And, and so it's not strictly vegan, but I think a lot of people are a little bit more loose on that. Um, so certainly that's our kind of position right now. Although funnily enough, like I literally was talking to someone today who um, mentioned a company that's developing a bee-free honey. It's a sort of, um, uh, I, can't, I can't even describe how it's made, but it's- Synthetic it's, honey? It's, it's synthet synthetic honey using, um, not just sort of mimicking the flavors, but actually making the same sort of chemical compound. Um, so I'm really curious about that. I think that's something we might see, you know, in stores relatively soon um, as well. All right. So I'll pick up where Dan left off uh, before the honey question. So I do want to dive in a little bit more in this switch from B to B to B to C, because in my mind, in the business world in general, we're so accustomed to compartmentalizing. In the very beginning of your business, you decide you're B to B or you're B to C. Or some companies start B to C, like Slack, and then turn into B to B. And it's such a unique story, in my opinion, to start as B to B to B to C. So I would love for you to tell us a little bit more about how did this switch change the way you go to market? You mentioned that the sales is different. You mentioned that your role is different. How is your role different? Yeah. So, you know, I'm someone who probably has more experience in the B2B world. My previous company was a uh, translation technology company, and we tended to make most of our revenue from larger enterprise contracts. And so that's kind of the world I'm a little bit more familiar with. But you know, in terms of my broader kind of branding experience, I've done a fair amount of consumer stuff as well. And so I guess, you know, one of the nice things about switching to B2C is that um, personally for me, it's something that motivates me more is that you can do more fun marketing stuff. You know, the B2B world, sometimes it's more sales heavy, right? It's more uh, direct approach. And one of the things that we found with chefs, especially was, chefs are so busy they don't go to events they don't really look at advertising like the beta the way to get in touch with chefs is to be referred by another chef or like knock on the door of the kitchen you know and the funny thing about that market is you know it's not like you know when you're doing sales to like a big organization like a unilever or like a i don't know google or something it's all about like, how do I get in front of the right person, right? You might meet someone at a conference and then you get a business card and then you want to see if they know this person to get you, you know, it's all about You're that. telling us some of our story, Rob, you're going to make me cry. No, <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and then even when you find the right person, right, you might need to make like seven different presentations to them and they got to talk to their stakeholders and all this kind of stuff. Whereas with chefs, it was pretty much like if you, if you knock on the door of that restaurant kitchen, even if it's one of the top restaurants in the world, you'll probably be able to meet the person who you're actually going to sell to. Um, and really, it comes down to the product. It's like, is this thing good? And if it is, like, let's have a conversation. Okay, you know, if it's not, like, forget it. You're not going to get in that kitchen again. It's kind of over. There's no PowerPoint presentation that's going to convince a chef to buy, like, some salad. You know, it's not happening. So we kind of took that experience and really, I think what we came out of that, of course, was very, very a lot of confidence in our product. You know, it's it, it has been served in many three Michelin star restaurants. And so it's kind of the best out there. So we we're very confident about that. I think coming to consumers, it was much more a change of like, OK, well, how do we actually really find the target customer here? At the very beginning, it's like, who really is that? We kind of had a sense of people coming to our tours and classes, fair amount of tourists, but also some local New York folks. And they tended to be people who, of course, you know, cared about the quality of their food. A lot of the folks were also interested in nutrition and the impact of freshness on nutrition. You know, so if you buy salad greens from the grocery store, um, most of the time they're like two or three days old at best by the time they're on the shelf. And then by the time you take that home, of course, you know, it's only going to last uh, a few days after that. 
with our product, of course, we're harvesting in the morning. We deliver that day. So it's only been off the plant for like a few hours by the time you get it. And what people notice is the freshness. You know, that product is going to stay in your fridge. If you, if you leave it in your fridge, like literally two weeks later, it's still good, which is sort of this really surprising thing. Um, you don't get the mushy, like, you know, when spinach is sitting at the bottom of the bag kind of stuff, you don't get that, right? And I think that like, there's a, there's a cohort of people who really care about that stuff and they're looking for maximum nutrition. Of course, they don't want pesticides either. Of course, they want, um, you know, interesting product that they maybe can't get from the grocery store as well. And so we found this group of customers and we also realized that you know, hold on, like we're in Tribeca. This is where our farm is. And if you're not from New York City, like Tribeca is one of the wealthiest zip codes, really. We just happen to have the farm there because it's underneath the restaurant, which is just sort of a quirk of new real estate. But we knew that like, hey, that one of the advantages we have is that we are a local farm in Manhattan and there just aren't many of those. I mean, we're pretty much the only one that's a, you know, an indoor farm. And so we literally reached out to people in the neighborhood and like we got on this like neighborhood blog and found a bunch of neighborhood blogs and things. The, the kinds of things that's almost like the opposite of a lot of the consumer marketing that people do now. Like if you look at the strategies of a lot of consumer companies, they're going on Instagram and they're doing Facebook ads and they're doing stuff which is essentially very like internet platform driven. And we realized like, hey, you know, why aren't we just like talking to the people who live literally on the next street over or like who go to the same coffee shop? And so very sort of like almost like old school marketing uh, worked really well for us. Um, and getting to know those customers, of course, like was really helpful. And I think we found that like, yeah, there's there's a lot of people in New York City who are sort of, I, I often say like they aspire to go to the farmer's market, but they never get the time. You know, and for that group of people, like we're a really great offering. Uh, and and then the last piece was obviously that plastic waste thing. There's a, there's a whole bunch of people who care about plastic waste. Um, some people really take it into their own hands to be zero waste. And they've got the mason jars and they've got like the string bag and they go to the farmer's market, all that kind of stuff. I find that it tends to be the same thing where a lot of people aspire to be zero waste but a lot of people don't have the time or they don't quite have the energy and the resource, and the, you know, et cetera. And so what we're doing is making both of those things easier for people. Um, and yeah, we think there's a lot of people out there like that. And st still, of course, we're learning, but in the new farm that we're building, we're moving into another neighborhood. So it's in Prospect Heights in Brooklyn. And that's another neighborhood where there's probably more families, but a lot of people who really want to go to the farmer's market don't always get the time care about the waste problem, don't always have the time to do anything about it. And so we think we got a nice fit there. Um, but of course, you know, in terms of transitioning in the company and everything we do, yeah, big change. And really my yeah. focus, you know, when we were serving chefs, my focus a lot of the time was making sure we had that consistency and then looking at our sales approach and how to grow sales. Whereas with consumers, of course, it's much more about marketing and how do we portray what we're doing um, and how do we, you know, make sure it's an amazing experience for the customer uh, long term? There's a million other things I could say, but I'll stop there yeah. so that we can, you know, have a conversation and not a lecture. Yeah. Uh, super interesting again, and love the human old school marketing approach here of spreading the word. I'm curious, though, because, you know, you say that one of the things about shifting from B to B to B to C is, you know, we can tell investors now there's the potential for more scalability. One of the reasons that so many B2C companies love the Instagrams and the Facebooks is they, in theory anyway, permit faster scale, right? So I'm curious how with this more human connection approach, or perhaps that in combination with something else, how do we scale this? How do we get investors this massive potential return? Yeah, so we talk about the neighborhood farm now. And you know, the, the farm we're building in Brooklyn, it will serve about 2,000 people. We think there's potential for maybe 10 of those in New York City, and then, or maybe more, to be honest. And then going to a city like Chicago, I think we could also have 10 of those farms. And going to a smaller city like Columbus, Ohio, or something, we might have one or two of those farms. And, it, and I think there's a potential for us to have multiple farms within a city, essentially. But I think that, you know, part of the approach that we're trying to take, you know, if you look at 
some of the problems that are happening in the American capitalist society, I would say is like, there's been a huge reliance on gig workers. There's been sort of a misrepresentation of the costs of doing things like local delivery where, you know, companies like DoorDash, et cetera, like it's really not clear if they're making money on that process. Uh, and so a lot of the consumer sort of perception of that has been subsidized by VC money. And yeah. so there's been that, so some structural problems with some of those business models, but also there's been problems with how workers are treated, you know, like working as a gig worker on three different apps or something, not having any predictable income, not having access to healthcare or benefits, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And so we wanted to see if there's an approach where we can scale, but kind of do things the right way. And I think for us to do that, it's about building farms that are actually part of communities that are sort of visible in the neighborhood that aren't this abstract kind of digital concept, that they are physical places. And the advantage that we have also is that we can build physical locations where people can actually come as well. So now we're sort of, you know, New York like decided COVID was over yesterday with fireworks and stuff. Like, I, I really hope that's the case. Um, and so as we kind of open up again, there's a, we have a place where people can come, where our members yeah. can, you know, go to an event. And so all this kind of stuff, it's not to say that we don't use Instagram and it's not to say that we won't use social media as a form of advertising, but I think that we can do things within the community that are ultimately more longer lasting and create a stronger connection because I'm really, you know, trying to build a business where people, they subscribe and they stay and they start ordering more and more and more. And I think that's all about building something that has real uh, intrinsic value for them and it's part of the community. You know, it, it strikes me as we talk about some of the challenges with capitalism, it's so weird to reflect on. I think you're bang on that the door dashes of the world are absolutely subsidized by VC money. And in a way, it seems so uncapitalist, right? It's like this potential for maybe this return down the line. It's like, well, wait a second, are, are any of these companies profitable, right? Yeah. Um, it seems so uncompetitive. And like the incentive we expect of, oh, wait a second, we're going to create something really, really good we're going to find a way to build a viable business model under that. It seems so uncapitalist in a way. So I really like your more long-term approach of, hey, wait a second, like, let's actually produce something really, really great. And let's build a community to get excited around that thing. I'm curious, though, because there are so many incentives to go with this VC subsidized DoorDash model that we don't love. What are some of the challenges with this approach you've taken? Yeah, I mean, we're still, I got to say, we're still at the beginning of some of this stuff. And so I think in two years time, I might like, you know, say, hey, I didn't know what I was doing. So, so bear that in mind. Um, you know, I think what, one of the things I've learned about building a farm is, you know, and to be honest, I think I've learned as a person, you know, I, I came into this as someone who had worked on primarily software stuff, the kind of stuff where, not that it's, instant to build a software product but to scale it is relatively um it's a it's a standard approach now like right you can buy more virtual servers you can scale up your processes and, and stuff like that whereas farming you know plants grow at a certain speed and you can't force them to grow faster and if you have a pest problem or if there's an equipment failure or something like no amount of jumping up and down and screaming at people will fix that it's an intrinsic thing and so i think as a company uh, certainly our approach is to be more um uh, i don't want to abuse the word zen but somewhat like okay this is how it is this is what we're doing you know and i think we've also like it's been a new experience for me working with people who are working in quite um i would say our farm is like a horrible place to be but it's a hard job like it, it's hot sometimes, it's sweaty, things break, there's all kinds of goop on the floor sometimes, you know, this kind of stuff. And it's like, you you realize quite quickly that like people, I mean, it's so obvious, people are people. And so if you're doing this kind of gig economy stuff where you're literally farming out a job to someone and then they've got to ride down a busy street in the snow, like that's a real person. You know, and, and I think you can kind of get away with treating them like a number for a while. And then, you know, it's not it's not like a real long term strategy. And so I think we've we've sort of learned that not the hard way, but we've we've learned that through having people working for us and being part of the team and, and just realizing like, oh, OK, like it's better for us to do things the right way, the long term way. 
Um, but yeah, it's 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 tough to sort of scale companies quickly that way. Um, and I think that's why we're sort of so obsessed with the idea of like, okay, build out a farm, make sure that works, make sure that's really, really good before we replicate it um, quickly, you know? But yeah, lots of lots of new challenges to discover soon as well. So um, we'll see, we'll see. Love your mind. Something that I'm curious about is usually when you have investor money for a traditional company, you feel all this pressure to grow, 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 grow as fast as possible, make them returns. And when you told us, you know, we have to take a more Zen approach and there's only so much you could do about the pace of plant growth or if things break and you're trying to just build out one thing at a time, very mindfully. How do your investors feel about that? Yeah, well, I guess Farm One investors have been on a bit of a ride to be honest because, <laughs> you know, initially we kind of did think we were going to be able to scale more quickly and then... Um, you know, the first farm we built, we thought we were going to be able to build it for much less than it turned out. And then, um, I don't know, it was slower to acquire customers than we realized. And then we, we also um, focused a bit too much on the super high end restaurants. And so um, we didn't, we realized over time, okay, we need a mixture of like the really like um, amazing restaurants and then some other restaurants that are going to provide more revenue and that right mix of clients and that kind of stuff. And then of course, COVID was a huge hit because we had raised money in order to build a farm on the old model. You know, we were very close to signing a lease and luckily we didn't, um, but uh, you know, that could have been awful. Um, but yeah, I think that overall, you know, people who invest in Farm One, um, you know, they're investing in the team, they're investing in the idea of what we're doing. And it's very clear when you talk to us as a team, like, oh, okay, these guys are not trying to do X, Y, or Z. They're trying to do this thing. And, and that's what, either you love that about us or you don't, you know, like there's no, there's no point in pretending what we are. I've certainly worked with investors in the past where, um, that alignment was not as understood and it was not as clear. And it, you know, I eventually left my previous company because of that. Like it was just a strategic mis mismatch, you know? And so I think as I get older, like I'm kind of like, okay, well, this is who I am. And if you want to invest in my company, like this is what you're getting. And I think that there's, I, I don't think that means getting a lesser return. I think it means thinking about the long term and what you're trying to build. And, you know, certainly even if you take someone like Jeff Bezos, who is a flawed character in many ways, but what he did early on at Amazon was set the long term expectation for Amazon investors that this is not a quick return, but what we're building here is something bigger. I would argue now they've become too big, but I think that that long-term expectation allowed them to take risks and also invest in things that didn't have an immediate apparent return, like Amazon Web Services and the big logistics infrastructure and all this kind of stuff. So we're trying to do these hard things because I think that long-term, it gives us a really, really great opportunity to have these neighborhood farms at scale that are all using you know, great logistics infrastructure, great employee retention, great customer retention, all this stuff that takes a little bit longer to get. And it, it's it's kind of also things that are competitive moats for us that can defend us against, you know, people coming in and trying to be farm one. Mm -hmm. And what, what else kind of comes up for me is that farm one um, kind of touches on so many different major missions, everything from kind of healthy lifestyle and nutrition, local food, community building, zero waste. Then on the internal side, there's this whole like treating humans as humans, uh, respecting kind of people's needs and providing them what they need to live. I think that a lot of times, you know, your traditional investor um, is still a human. And when you are touching on so many deeply human wishes and goals for the world, do you feel like that changes their expectations and kind of opens up a side of them that's, I don't know, a little more mission driven? I think so. It certainly helps us meet people who are aligned with those goals as well. Like it's a self-fulfilling prophecy in a way. Like I've had businesses in the past where 
the investors we would meet would be bankers. <laughs> like, and there's nothing wrong with being a banker intrinsically, but it, did, it does tend to be this sort of like spreadsheet approach. Whereas with Farm One, it's people who, yeah, they care about the city, they care about diversity, they care about getting access to healthy food. And those are the kinds of people I want to be around with. You know, I want to like, I want to have a meeting with those people. I don't really want to have a meeting with just someone who's like looking at a spreadsheet the whole time, you know? And I think that the crucial thing is as well that consumers care about this more than, more than ever. And if you're uh, a consumer going into a grocery store now, you're reading the label, you're reading like the back of the product label, you're trying to discover like, who, who is this company? Like, what are they actually doing? These, these increasingly consumers are making this part of their decision-making process because you know, if it comes to cereal or something, there's, there's a thousand different cereals, like, of course, you know, but there's only a few that are run by, you know, a women-led business or someone who's supporting Black-owned businesses in the community or someone who's, you know, looking at heirloom grains and trying to regenerate the soil and that kind of thing. And I think for consumers now, like, we're looking for this stuff. We're looking for our purchases to align with our values, and ultimately as well, I think we're also a little bit exhausted by that whole process. And we're looking for companies to kind of do the right things so that we don't have to worry about it that much anymore. And one of the reasons we're trying to make zero waste really easy is because it's hard. And like me as a consumer, I don't always manage to do that. I end up with plastic bags and take out containers and stuff. And I just wish someone would take care of it sometimes, you know? So we're trying to do that. And, and like, we're also, we're trying as a company, like not to pretend that we're perfect either. I think that a lot of sustainability stuff is like holier than thou, like I'm, you know, this and this, and you have to do that. And if you don't do that, you're a bad person. Like, I want to, I want to just be a lot more like realistic, like, okay, we, we're really trying our best. We're trying to make it easier for you. Um, but it's hard. Um, and yeah, sorry, that sounds like a really muddy answer, but we're trying to do all this stuff and we think that people engage with that. We think that's, you know, a better way of doing business. You know, I was just, I, I felt guilty initially when you started speaking because I was going to pull out my spreadsheet, but then you gave me permission to feel like I'm not a terrible human being just because I have one. So I think we're, yeah. we're all good. Yes. But, um, <laughs> you know, it, so much of that resonates. And, you know, for us as a company, we talk about we're, we're as a business growth company, helping usually B2B companies grow their businesses. You know, for us, we love this idea of, we call it kind of mindful business growth. Growth for growth's sake is such a powerful motivating force these days. And I, my hope is that, you know, in this pandemic moment, the deliberation and thoughtfulness with which we build our businesses, with which we speak to customers, with which we treat employees, there's this potential to really like growth is, is such a galvanizing force for all of our decisions. And if we can come at growth from a different energy, a more thoughtful, mindful, deliberate energy, I think there's a spillover effect, which influences all of the subsequent decisions we make. And so, you know, for us, we look at our mission, like um, that's really, really a big part of it. Mindful business growth. Yeah, absolutely curious um just as we we come towards the end of our time together you know you're building this awesome company you have a great great mission when you're not doing that what do you do for fun what do i do for fun oh yeah. yeah well i think that what i've really learned maybe during COVID, a lot of people have done this like i love cooking and it's something that like you know i've done a fair amount in my life but it's really in the past year that i've really kind of I realized like, oh, I just love this so much, you know, like coming, I, I was about to say coming home. I don't come home. I am at home. But like at the end of the day, cooking something for my fiance and like, she's like finishing up at work and I'm like cooking in the kitchen and I'm making something. It doesn't have to be very super, super fancy, but doing that is like a really nice process for me. It takes my mind off things. I can have a glass of wine. I can have like a little taste of what I'm eating and just be a little bit creative in that sense. That is like such a nice place for me. Um, that is amazing. I, I'm lucky enough to have access to a swimming pool in New York City. And so I love doing that. Um, my favorite, I think it's okay to say this now because it's New York and it's like my favorite thing is to have an edible 
and then go for a swim. And that is like the best like me time on a Friday evening because yeah. you know the week is over. I can come up with ideas while I'm swimming and I'm just like swimming away and then coming up with silly stuff. And then by the end of it, I'm feeling great. So so those two things are like the cornerstone of my happiness. And if I can do those, you know, multiple times a week, I'm in a great place. In this space, it is more than okay to say that. Love it. Um, and isn't it wonderful how edibles bring out this humorous, relaxed, like it's such a beautiful contrast yeah. from the business energy sometimes of got to get yeah. shit done, right? And edible is such a nice opposite energy. Yeah, hundred percent, you know, and like yeah. I, that swimming as well, I don't know, it just unlocks great things. So a perfect evening would be, for me would be for go for a swim and then make like a slightly creative pasta dish or something and then eat that with with Gabby and you know I'm good there you go curious are there any social media handles websites anything you want watchers to follow in case they you know obviously many of them are going to be horrified by everything you've said and are going to have no interest in following anything you're doing but for those that survived this interview and are interested how, how can they follow the journey yeah, so we're at farm.1. Uh, we're on Instagram. We try to do interesting stuff there. We also do some interviews with people on the farm. And so you can see our YouTube channel. Uh, there's a bunch actually in the can that are about to get released soon. But we try to help people be more thoughtful about their food. So we in interview like a chef or someone who's making a food product or someone who's got an urban farm. Uh, and we're trying to like tell those stories and bring those out there. Um, and we'll be doing more and more and more of that. So farm one on Instagram and on YouTube. Awesome. Well, look, Rob, thank you so much for joining us today. I love this interview. I love what you're building. And I'm sure everyone who's watching will be very inspired. Thanks for having me. It's been super fun.